All right, everybody, good morning. Welcome back. Hopefully, you guys are having a great morning. Good to see everybody. Um, we just continue with our virtual semester here. Uh, Chapman, 9 a.m. crew, welcome back, everybody. I know we're still a few minutes before class time, but as my usual custom nowadays, I'm trying to arrive a little early uh, for the benefit of those that might have been here in attendance a little early. So anyways, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna go through another important lecture on this new topic we're developing, the theory of knowledge epistemology. We have a little bit left over from Monday uh, that we will finish, and then we're gonna add to that some additional notes um, as we go over the work of uh, Edmund Gettier. So that's the plan today, not to rush. We still have some time, but good to see a few people already here. Good morning, you guys. Hopefully, you're off to a great start today. <clears throat> nice, nice. <clears throat> Well, I guess it's April Fool's. Uh, I don't know, maybe this isn't the year. Uh, it might have been canceled to, in 2020. But um, yeah, I've had some fun days past messing around with people, but I don't know, might be a little bit too mean today. What is my favorite type of cheese? Okay, fair question. Um, I mean, I, li I like a wide variety of artisanal cheeses. Uh, so we could go with um, like a hard cheese, like something aged, like an old cheddar or something. I mean, I'm also fond of uh, all the blue gorgonzola type of weird cheeses and stuff. Hey, Lucas, how are you? Um, Brie, you know. Okay, lately I've been eating these little cheese curds uh, that are delicious as snacks. You can get those too. Come in different flavors. Yeah. Um, big time snacker, especially now you know, trapped in the house all day, so um, definitely hitting up the pantry, uh, fully stocked. So I've had every excuse to indulge my grocery shopping, um, you know, desires to their fullest extent. So yeah, there's a lot of cheese, even just right now. I mean, what's in the fridge? There's like a hatch chili uh, flavored cheese. There are these garlic cheese curds. Anyway, Marissa asked me about cheese, so. Not to say this is philosophical, but um, you know, always down to, to get serve you some knowledge about whatever the topic may be, whether it's cheese or anything else. <clears throat> I have a lot of friends that don't eat cheese, vegans and stuff. So, um, but there's actually, I guess, uh, some interesting assortments even for those folks. Um, well, there used to be anyway. I don't know. Now the thing's closed, so good luck. Hey, Emily, nice to see you. Good morning. Continue filing in, everybody. Uh, as I've noticed, it seems like we get our, you know, peak numbers for attendance as uh, like five minutes into the lecture period. So I'm still hanging in there, waiting for a few more. <clears throat> Hopefully, everyone's feeling great, staying healthy. Um, I don't know anybody personally uh, who's really been affected in a major way by this virus. Um, so I hope to keep it that way and I have a good healthy group of students this semester getting through this whole episode. <clears throat> okay, a couple more minutes till 9 a.m. <clears throat> If you know people in the class, um, I don't know how well in touch you guys are, especially now with this quarantine situation, but feel free to tell people we are going live. It's not new though, I think everyone knows the format at this point. <clears throat> okay, two minutes to go and then we'll start it up. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm just, you know, um, teaching these classes, trying to go on little runs in the local neighborhood, 
to stay healthy and fit, playing Tetris and stuff, watching a lot of Netflix. Same stuff I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing, or at least to some degree. <clears throat> cool. Potato chip flavor. I mean, the food questions really, really, uh, really hit me with some tough ones. I don't know. My personality. Uh, I don't know what's the best flavor. Just you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, barbecue chips are a fan favorite. I like those. Uh, sour cream and onion are pretty nice. You know, we all got favorites, right? I like the jalapeno spicy chips too. Some people are not a big fan. Hey Cameron, good morning. <clears throat> okay, we're getting close to our time. So let's make it happen. <clears throat> Get ready for some important information on knowledge and epistemology. We're gonna go straight in there in just a few seconds. <clears throat> Kitty, where you at? Cats eating in the other room. Hey, Bella. Nice to see everybody. Okay. Um, all right, guys. I guess we got um, enough people, and it's about that time. So welcome back, everyone. Good morning to you. Hey, Ellen, uh, Elon, rather, Matthew, Bella, Cameron, Marissa, and others. Um, welcoming all you guys back. And to those that are watching this any later time, I uh, hope you guys are doing well, too. Uh, so today it's April the 1st of 2020. It's our Wednesday meeting. We have um, another lecture on this new topic that we're starting to go through, which is the theory of knowledge, epistemology. So that's really the topic, knowledge. Now, um, just a couple of reminders about what we did last time. Um, on Monday, I started just talking to you guys about the concept of knowledge and epistemology. Epistemology is just the philosophy word that refers to the theoretical study of knowledge. Um, in other words, the theory of knowledge. And so questions in this range involve things like, what uh, is knowledge? How do we attain it? What is the difference between actually knowing something and merely having a lucky, correct belief about it or a guess? Um, so I told you that the first written accounts, hey Hugh, the first written accounts in the Western world um, of the concept of knowledge date back to the ancient Greeks and the work of Plato um, and his teacher Socrates, who's a character that is used in most of these Platonic writings to advance the ideas of the philosopher. Um, so I started last meeting just by going over some of the brief history of the life and times of Socrates, uh, who's this great you know, ancient philosopher that's considered kind of a founding father of the whole discipline in our um, tradition. Uh, I told you that he was a teacher who gathered in the town square and just quizzed people on their beliefs, tested their beliefs, engaged them in dialogue and debate, and had the ability through his uh, persuasive question and answer method to change people's minds or to get them to reconsider their own views. Um, and because of that, he had a loyal following of younger folks, but there were also some in the established government that didn't like what he was doing. They arrested him. And anyway, we know how the story ends. Uh, he was charged and executed, but Plato continued on. And um, today we're reading some of the works of Plato as he discusses the topic of knowledge uh, through um, the conversation that his teacher Socrates had with a Greek general named Mina. There's one little piece of uh, vocabulary, I think, that I didn't mention about Socrates last time that I don't want to uh, leave behind. Hey, Logan. Um, so let me just put this one term on the table as we refer to Socrates again, there's a Greek word called elenchus. Okay. Elenchus is the word that you see written there, E-L-E-N-C-H-U-S. That is just the word that stands for Socrates' uh, distinctive method of critical question and answer. So that's the way that he would chat at people, talk to them, engage them in dialogue. Socrates' method of um, critical 
question and answer. I'll just say Q and A. So that's the Greek word for it. A lot of times today we just call it the Socratic method. It's a method by means of discussion and engaged conversation that you would lead someone into new realizations, uh, new insights, uh, or to at least d develop the topic of conversation a little more. So elenchus is a word that you'll see in connection with uh, the work of Socrates and his ideas. So back, back to what I was going over in the big picture, Socrates is a teacher, Plato is one of the students, we have writings of Plato that have survived that discuss the concept of knowledge. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the one uh, that does essentially feature the, the definition of knowledge from the ancient Greek world. But we had some vocabulary that we were also trying to develop first so that we could approach that in the best level of uh, detail. So what were some of the vocabulary items that we did get to cover? One of them was the word proposition. I'm not gonna write the whole definition again, but I just wanna return your mind to that word for a second. A proposition, maybe you can remember, uh, what does this word mean in a philosophical sense? A proposition is otherwise known as the what? What is a proposition? Let's just see who can tell me that, and we can go from there. You're right, correct, Marissa. It's the meaning of a sentence. Um, not to be confused with the, the sentence itself because there can be cases where you have two, thanks Matthew, yes, correct. There could be two distinct sentences, but they have the same meaning. So I give you one example. The snow is white, that's English. Der Schnee ist weiss, that's German. But although those two sentences sound different, they don't have different meanings. They mean the same thing. Or even within English, I'm in the kitchen, true enough. The kitchen is where I am, same thing. Uh, it's just stated in a different way switching out the subject of the sentence from me to the kitchen itself. Okay, so when you have different surface forms of uh, word or symbol, but they mean the same underlying content, then they have the same propositional content. Okay, then I asked you guys, what does the word truth mean? Or at least try to discuss the topic. Um, and for a statement or sentence to be true, what do we say that is? If a sentence is true, what does that even mean? True sentence, in other words, What's going on with the true sentence? Let's see if you could just throw that out there. Going back to your memory, to your notes, to your common sense, a true statement, a true sentence. What does this amount to? What has to be the case for a sentence to be true? Let's see, what do you know? <clears throat> When the proposition matches the facts of reality, yeah. When what the sentence says does match the actual world. Um, so, for example, correct, right now I'm wearing glasses, that's true. Um, it's something I'm saying, but I'm not just saying it, it's actually happening, so it's true. If I told you, um, you know, like, I don't know, I'm not wearing glasses, or I'm wearing a blazer, or a hat. Those are just all false statements. I'm just making up sentences right now about my attire at this time, but if I told you that um, the moon's made out of cheese or whatever. It's made out of Swiss cheese or, you know, brie or anything else. That's not true. That's the statement, but that's not what's actually the case. So anyway, uh, truth is when the content of the sentence matches the world and the facts. Now we're going on a little bit further with our development of vocabulary in um, epistemology. So that's what we did last time. We talked about Socrates. We started going over a couple of terms within the field of epistemology, but I have more for you. Okay, so more epistemology vocabulary. So the next term that we're all going to try and get clear about is the word belief. <clears throat> and I'm going through these words, these vocabulary items in a precise order of, for a particular reason. There's a reason because for you to know what, for example, the word truth means, you have to first understand that it has to do with the content of a proposition. So I had to begin with proposition and then go into the term truth. And now we're discussing belief because for you to understand what the concept of belief is, you already have to have some working understanding of the word truth. So these kind of piggyback on each other and build on each other. So let us that's a hint to you. The word belief, what does that mean? And here's your hint. It has something to do with a statement uh, or the concept being true. So if a person believes a statement, what do you think that means? Like if you believe a statement or sentence, what does this uh, say about the individual who believes the sentence? That they what? 
let's see if you can give me a guess um, or a reasoned you know, attempt at this answer. Um, to believe, to have a belief in a sentence means what? Just if you had to guess. Like, so for example, some people believe that, uh, I mean, I would hope most all, everyone believes that the earth is a globe, like a sphere, but there are a small contingent of people that think it's uh, flat. So those two individuals had different beliefs, the flat earther versus the, the common conception that it's a globe. Okay, Matthew, good, good. You say to think that it is true, and that is actually exactly correct. You're right. So in order, uh, well, Hugh, you say to accept something as true without evidence, not necessarily. You could have evidence for the thing you believe. You could be, let's say, a detective who believes that some certain person is guilty because you have uh, fingerprint data that matches what they have on the file, their own fingerprint. And that's like evidence-based belief that Jones is the killer, right? So it's not necessarily that it's without evidence. Sometimes you can believe things with no evidence at all. Like if I just right now choose to believe that there's a person named uh, Alexander um, somewhere living in this city or something like that. I mean, I guess statistically I would have such evidence, but um, you understand, yeah, you can form beliefs without evidence, but for the most part, people use evidence to determine what they think is true or false. But back to your suggestion, Matthew, which is definitely correct. To have a belief is just to think that a sentence is true. So belief is just when a person thinks that a sentence is true. <clears throat> okay. So beliefs are just what you think are true. Um, and in that sense, beliefs can differ from individual to individual, and of course they do. Um, not everybody has exactly the same beliefs. One big difference between different belief systems that we've already discussed in our class is the statement that God exists. Not every single person believes that, right? Theists do. Most people, I guess, would say they do believe that, but then there are some that don't agree. They think it's not true. Um, in fact, that God exists. Or, you know, people disagree about policy uh, or, or moral questions. One person may say um, it's, it's wrong um, to, uh, to have an abortion. Another person says, no, it's not wrong. Um, so they have different beliefs about that moral proposition. Um, to the question of the surface of the earth I mentioned. Some people will say it's a sphere, a small, uninformed, perhaps minority people will say it's a flat disk. But look, here's the thing, even though two people can have two different beliefs, there's still only one world. So the facts are objective, but beliefs are, we can say, subjective. For example, if one person thinks the earth is a sphere, and that's their belief, and another person believes, no, it's a disk, it's flat, they can have their two beliefs, but there are not two shapes to the planet. There's one objective world, one set of facts, and people just are sometimes not all on the same page about what those facts are, right? I can say I believe that there is extraterrestrial life in outer space. Another person may say, I don't think that's true. Um, and we could have these two different beliefs, but we cannot both be correct, you see. There's only going to be one answer to the question whether there are or are not. It can't both be that there are and also that there are not. So anyway, beliefs. Beliefs are what things you think are true. Um, I'm sure right now you have a belief about, let's say, where your car is parked if you drive or, um, you know, where your phone is at if you have one. Um, and so those are beliefs, in other words, statements that you think are facts, okay? Now, ideally, in a perfect sense, we would only want our beliefs to be true because that means that the way you think the world is is the way that it is. You're getting things correct. Um, you don't want to have false beliefs, right? If you had a false belief about how to answer a question on a test, uh, then you would get the answer wrong, uh, and you'd be misinformed about what's really happening. So, you know, when you have false beliefs, you think the world is a certain way, but by definition of truth, if your belief is false, you're wrong about the way the world is, and you want to have a correct appreciation of the facts and reality. So the goal of beliefs is for them to be true. Um, you're asking, Marissa, is this statement-based? Statements correspond or do not correspond to facts. So it's not merely based on statements. It depends on the connection between the statements and what's happening in the world. So I don't know if your question is, is this all just wordplay and language? No, it's about the world. The world has a set of facts and statements either mirror those facts or they don't. If I'm telling you right now that I'm wearing a hat, 
It's a statement which is false. If I tell you I'm wearing glasses, it is a statement which is true. So statements don't have some disconnected, untethered relationship to reality when they're true statements. If I'm telling you storybook fables or made up make believe lies, then I'm making statements that don't connect to reality. But most of the time when we're trying to be truthful, honest, and uh, you know, exercise careful judgment, we do in fact get to the correct facts and we form beliefs that mirror reality. Okay, so we've started with these terms, proposition, truth, belief, okay? Now I have another couple for you and then we'll get into the meno. The next term is justification. So that's a new one for us. And let's see if we can figure the meaning of this. What do you think it means for a person's belief to be justified? So we've said a belief is when someone thinks something is true. Okay. What do you think would have to be so if we say of the person's belief that it is a justified belief as opposed to, let's say, an unjustified belief? What do you think makes the difference between when you have a belief that's justified and when you have a belief that has no justification? Maybe we can judge the correct answer to this question. What would it be to have justification for a belief that one has? What could that be? <clears throat> what does it mean? Well, okay, Ella, you say it's proven, and that's along the correct lines, but it's maybe a little too bold because justification doesn't necessarily mean it's been absolutely proven beyond all possibility of doubt but it does mean that there's good evidence or reasons to back up that belief, okay? So you're right in the sense that it has to do with proof and evidence, but it doesn't have to be so absolutely solidly proven that there's no capacity to doubt it, right? So let me give you the definition based on that. Justification, it's just when a person has good reasons or evidence to support their belief. Okay, justification, that's what it is. It's when a person has got good reasons, good evidence to support the thing that they think is true. In other words, to back up their belief. Um, so, you know, sometimes our beliefs have good justification. Take again the case of like a court of law. Um, if you're, let's say, an attorney, um, a lawyer, whatever, and you know, you're trying to make the prosecutor's case that someone's guilty, you can't just go up there and say to the jurors and judge, can we just throw this person in jail and get this over with? I mean, we all got busy lives. Who cares about evidence? Just look, you know, I feel like they're guilty. No, you have to make a case. You have to be able to prove it. And it's not that you have to be able to prove it beyond all possibility of doubt, but beyond any reasonable doubt. So you have to be able to state facts in the courtroom that make it seem like so-and-so is guilty. You know, you might show motive. You might show means. You might show forensic evidence. You might show testimony from witnesses, whatever. And when those facts are all stated, the person that's in the jury box has to render a verdict and they make a decision based on whether they thought the case was proven of guilt or whether it was not sufficiently proven. Now, in everyday life, maybe we're not acting as jurors, but we're still people trying to figure out what's true and false. You know, so let's say an item of yours went missing. Now you're trying to find out what happened to it. Um, maybe you're going to try and go back into your memory, think about all the places you've been, what could have been the explanation as to why you don't have it right now. Um, when you form judgments about any subject whatsoever, if those are well-based judgments that are uh, justified, then there's evidence that supports them. Uh, for you to, let's say, rely on uh, public health information given by the CDC, you take it to be sound advice, but you're relying on the scientific evidence that the experts have uh, used to determine these procedures and protocols. So justification is just having good evidence or reasons to believe something. Um, do you believe that I'm wearing glasses right now? I would think so. Uh, is it a justified belief? I also think it's justified. What's the evidence um, that I'm wearing glasses? What kind of evidence is there that this man is wearing glasses right now um, on April the 1st, 918 a.m. in 2020? I think the evidence is pretty clear. You're looking at it. It's uh, photographic and video evidence captured on this live stream. Um, and that gives you some reason to think. 
that I was wearing the glasses, right? Now, I don't know. Some beliefs don't have justification, though. Sometimes people believe things, but without any very good reason, um, or the evidence that they have is insufficient to make the, the case for it. Sometimes people believe things that they hope are true, whether or not there's any evidence to prove it. We kind of talked about that with W.K. Clifford. Um, yes, you can see them. Your perception, you know, your vision appears to see the image of the glasses on my face. So that's pretty solid evidence. Um, seeing is believing, as they say. Now, suppose that uh, you're not attending this live stream, but someone that did told you, hey, Vulich gave a lecture today. He was wearing glasses. Then your evidence would be the report of the person's testimony, not having witnessed it through your own two eyes, but having heard it secondhand from other people. So there's all kinds of sources of evidence, whether it's direct perception, testimony, memory, inference, or some combination of those. But anyway, that's what justification is. It's having good evidence or reasons to believe things. Okay. Now, um, one more or two more of these vocabulary terms. Let me erase here so that we can put them on the table. <clears throat> I next wanted to mention the term or concept of epistemic agent. So what is an epistemic agent? Okay, an epistemic agent is just a being that is capable of having beliefs or knowledge. <clears throat> All right, so that's the term epistemic agent. Um, it just means anything that exists which is able to at least have beliefs or knowledge. Um, so it's quite interesting to think about this for a moment. Uh, would you say that you are an epistemic agent and me and the others in this live stream? Are we all epistemic agents? <clears throat> I mean, this is an easy one. Yes, clearly we are. We're beings that can and do form beliefs, have knowledge about a variety of topics, large and small. Maybe you know some things about history. Maybe you know the date of the signing of the Declaration of Independence or, um, you know, at least like that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Or maybe you know facts about even further uh, geographic regions and history of those parts of the world. Maybe you know things about outer space, like that we're the third planet from the sun or maybe you know principles of physics or chemistry or biology. There's all kinds of knowledge that we humans can and do possess. So we are certainly epistemic agents. Question though, like this marker that I'm writing things with that's in my hand, is this marker an epistemic agent, do you think, or no? And that's also an easy one, but I just wanna kinda of make it very clear and we'll go through the discussion about that. But what, do you think the marker is an epistemic agent like me and you? Certainly not, it is not, no. It's not that this marker and why not? I mean, what's the reason that it's not? Well, it should be clear enough because it's an inanimate object. It doesn't have a perceptual system. It doesn't have a central nervous system. So, of course, it's not, you know, taking in the lecture like me and you and thinking interesting discussion of knowledge here. Um, so one thing that's quite fascinating just about the human condition or just being a living thing at all, like we are, is that we are epistemic agents. We're not just objects, but we're subjects. We observe the world. We perceive it. We take in information about it and we think about it and contemplate it. But if you really look at the vast expanse of the physical universe, I think it's probably a fair point to say that most all things that physically exist, if you were to like just take a, a measurement in terms of mass or weight, the vast majority of things in this universe are not epistemic agents. It's just dead matter, inanimate objects, inorganic substances, you know, existing out there, just kind of being, but not at all having perception, belief, or knowledge. So it's quite fascinating and I think, um, you know, valuable. Uh, it's a very privileged position to occupy the, the position of an epistemic agent. Um, now, we humans are perhaps the most sophisticated, of course, of the life forms that could have beliefs or knowledge. But do you think there are any other epistemic agents that are not human? Could there be? Maybe? Anyone have a view about that or maybe a thought? Do you think there are non human epistemic agents? Um, what could those be? Like, for example, do you think animals could have knowledge or have beliefs? 
I mean, there's lots of non-human animals on the planet Earth. Uh, I wonder what your view is. I mean, could they be things that also form beliefs and have knowledge? Well, if you don't want to hazard or attempt to guess, I would throw my own view out there. And I would say, yeah, uh, I do think that there is, you know, there's, of course, cognitive behavior. There's perception. There's the central nervous system of these other life forms. And so they, I believe, can possess knowledge to a certain extent. Yeah, Matthew, but it's probably, of course, not as sophisticated as our own, you know, with the higher powers of cognition that the human being has. Uh, we know things of a much more, um, you know, special variety than animals would. Maybe an animal could know whether there's danger or a source of food or, um, you know, maybe it could become habituated to certain routines like, like your pet dog knows, as it were, when you've arrived home or when you're about to open up a can of food. Um, but human knowledge is, is much more um, expansive. So anyway, whether there are other beings that are epistemic agents besides us and whether animals kind of count as somewhat along that scale, certainly we are. And then there are certainly clear, like hard no cases like of these inanimate objects and stuff. So anyway, um, we are part of what we're studying in this part of the class because we're interested in the concept of knowledge, which we are beings that can possess. Marissa asks, isn't it a little problematic to decide considering we don't necessarily have a stable definition of knowledge though? Well, uh, fair point, I guess, but whatever knowledge is, even if there are some unclarity at the margins about how to precisely set down the definition, we have the ability to form beliefs at a minimum. That's something that is, I think, uncontroversial and well-established. So. We're epistemic agents even in the sense that we can attempt to form knowledge and that we can have um, a perception of our environment and form attitudes about it. So in that very broad sense, certainly we are epistemic agents. Whether animals are or not depends on the extent to which they have beliefs. But I think that their behavior exhibits um, evidence that they do in fact have at least some rudimentary type of beliefs, even if they're not guided by language as human thoughts are. Okay, so um, with those vocabulary terms in mind, I'm ready to tell you what the ancient Greek definition of knowledge is. This is the standard definition of knowledge that had been uh, claimed for thousands of years. Um, so it really had a very robust base of support and a lot of people thought it made a lot of sense and it does. Um, but after we learn about it, I'll also tell you how it was criticized in the modern day for being still not yet fully sufficient. So what is knowledge in the way that the Greeks thought. This is what they say knowledge is. It's simply a justified true belief. A justified true belief. So that's what knowledge is. Um, it is a combination of those three conditions put together. So for a subject to know something, <clears throat> first of all, they have to think that it's true. That's to believe that it's true. But then in addition to that, they have to be correct. They have to get it right. So they have to have a belief and it also has to be true. But even that is not enough if they're missing the third component, which is to have justification. So you need all three. You therefore have to have a belief, something you think is true. On top of that, it actually really is true. And then the third thing, you have reasons or evidence to support that belief that you have that is true. In case all three of these conditions line up, then that is a statement, a proposition that the individual knows. But if even one of the three conditions is not satisfied, then that's a failure of knowledge and it's not really knowledge. Let me try and explain to you guys why each one of the conditions is necessary for knowledge so that even if one is missing, it's not gonna be knowledge but that they are um, jointly sufficient. So in combination, all three produce knowledge, but two out of three or one out of three is not enough. You gotta have them all. Okay, so let me give you some common sense examples to help you see why each one of those conditions is needed. Let's go into the term truth. By the way, just to give you guys, makes this into a couple letters. K, standing for knowledge, is equivalent to the conjunction of JTB where JTB stand for the three terms, justification, truth, and belief. So sometimes you see in discussions of knowledge, this little formula put forward, that knowledge is a JTB, justified true belief. Okay, so let me explain why those conditions are necessary. It's somewhat, I think, intuitive, but it's always good to reinforce the understanding. So <clears throat> say that you're taking a multiple choice uh, test in one of those other classes, and um, the question is asked of you, 
what year was the Declaration of Independence of the United States signed? They're testing your knowledge. They, they want to see, do you know this or not? So they give you four options, okay? Let's say option letter A was 1776. B, um, 1876. C, 1950. D, 2020. So what's the question on the quiz or test? They're asking you, what's the date or year anyway that the Declaration of Independence was signed in the United States? Let's suppose that our student is not so good with their history. And they're like, what year was it? I have no idea at all. I mean, uh, whatever, I think it's B. So let me fill in bubble B. Did the person know the answer? Easy enough to say, did they know it or not? If they filled in B in response to this question. Is that knowledge? It's not knowledge. What's wrong with that answer? They, they believe that's the answer, so why don't they know it? They, they're, they're, the belief condition is there. They believe it's 1876, so isn't that good enough for knowledge? What's wrong? Why is it that they don't get credit for knowing the answer? It's not true. Exactly, Mason. It's not true. So you can't say they know when they give the false, incorrect response. To know, you have to actually get it right. Otherwise, we would say there's no difference between a correct answer or an incorrect answer. And we would just give people the, the same credit for either type of response. It would say everything's knowledge. Correct answers, false answers, who cares? It's all knowledge. But of course, it's not. So at a minimum, it has to be correct. It has to be correct. Um, therefore, in this case, we know our, stu our student doesn't know. The student cannot know that 1876 is when the Declaration of Independence was signed because simply stated that's not a fact, it's not true. He can't know anything that's false. For example, could a person know, know that me, Vulich, was born in 1920? Could anybody know that about me? Is that something that a person could know about this person that I am? Yes or no? Question is, could somebody know that Vulich is born in 1920? Let's see if you can think about the answer. What's the answer you're giving me? Someone could know that I'm born in 1920? No, come on. Obviously, no way. I think you're forgetting what we just said. How is it not, how, I mean, a person cannot know that I was born in 1920, and why could they not know that? They can't know something if it's not true, correct. At best, a person could what regarding me being born in 1920? At best, a person could, if it was true, they could. But yeah, I know, Matthew, but here's the point. I mean, let's be honest. Everyone knows that I'm not 100 years old. Is that, I hope, obvious? So you can't know that I'm born in 1920 because I'm not. But a person maybe could believe that if they were misinformed or, I don't know, on weird drugs or something. If they were really way out there and they thought that was true, they could believe it. But they couldn't know it because knowing means it has to actually be true. Okay? So I'm just kind of working with you guys on a few examples of like how a person cannot know something false. Nobody in the whole world could ever know that I was 100 years old right now, because I'm not. Uh, nobody in the world could know that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1876, because that's just not what happened. Um, nobody can know that the moon is made of cheese, because it's not. And nobody can know that the earth is flat, because it's not. But people can believe false things. You just can't know things that are false. I mean, maybe I'm immortal, who knows? We'll find out later, but. Um, they could know that it wasn't true, that's correct, but that's a different proposition. That's the denial of the original example. Okay, now here, let's go into something else. I want to help you guys understand why other conditions are required as well. So, say the same question was asked, right? What year was Declaration of Independence signed? Was it uh, 1776, 1876, 1920, or 2020? Okay, now we've got a second type of student. Here's their thought process. They're like, okay, I wish I would have studied. Damn, this is a tough one. Declaration of Independence. I'm trying to figure this out. I can't remember. Okay, well, let's see. 2020, that's the current year. So, I mean, that's probably too recent. I'm going to eliminate that option. So now we got three. Okay, I've narrowed it down to three. Now, 1950, just, I think it had something to do with 76. Something in my mind remembers 76. I just don't know what century. So let's say it's between A and B. I have no idea. I'm going to fill in B. Nah, okay, maybe it's just A. I'll just go with A. I'm guessing. I'm going to take a random hunch that it's A. So they filled in A. Now, does that person know the answer? They got it right, but did they really know the answer? You could maybe tell me what you think. The person who filled it out that way, did they know 
that it was signed in 1776? I mean, they got the correct answer, but did they really know it? Because hopefully you followed my description, right? They got it down to two, but then they just guessed. It's just a guess, correct, Mason? They didn't really know the answer. Later on, when they get the test back and they see that they got it correct, they'll probably be like, yes, I'm so happy I got that because I really didn't even know the answer. I just guessed. So don't you see, therefore, that there's more to getting knowledge than just having a lucky guess that happens to be correct? You actually have to have evidence. Another example. Uh, suppose I'm a lover of science fiction, and I do think a lot of those movies are pretty cool. So I watch one, and I think, you know, we can't be alone in this universe. There's got to be life somewhere out there in this big universe. So I believe it. But do you say I know right now? Do I know currently that there's alien life in outer space? Can I know this? I mean, I might be correct, but I don't really know it, right? Because I would need better evidence before I could claim knowledge, okay? Now, um, another example that I think I briefly mentioned last time, say take the number of people alive right now on Earth, people alive on Earth. Could it be an even number? Sure it could. That's easily possible. It's 50% possibility because there's just even and odd uh, numbers. <clears throat> so maybe it's even number. Maybe suppose I love things that are even and I hate all things odd. So I just choose and hope to believe that it's true that there's an even number of people right now. Now, maybe I'm correct, but do I know it? No, I can't know that because for me to know that I would have to actually have evidence, which gives me proof that there's an even number of people right now. So in these different cases that I'm mentioning, we're talking about a person who has a correct belief, it's true, but they don't have the evidence or reasons to back it up. And therefore, even though they're getting it right, it's just a correct opinion, it's not really knowledge. Okay? Um, if you're a juror, and let's say the defendant walks in the court, and you're biased, and you just see their appearance, and you say, anybody who looks like that, I believe they're guilty. I don't care what the lawyers say. That biased juror does not really know that the individual is guilty. Even if they do happen to be guilty, they have not yet heard the presentation of evidence and arguments. So what they're talking about right now is a belief that they hold, but it wouldn't count as knowledge until it had been somehow demonstrated through proof or justification. Okay, so that was my little breakdown for you guys of how to understand the conditions for knowledge. It's a justified true belief. So knowledge exists when an epistemic agent thinks that a statement is true. Furthermore, it actually is true. And then on top of those two, they have to have some type of reasons that they're aware of, which indicate that it's likely to be true. Um, and one more thing about this little equation, JTB. The way that epistemologists speak of it is they say these three conditions are individually needed. Each one is necessary, but they're not enough by themselves. So they're only sufficient or enough collectively. So they're jointly sufficient, but individually necessary. If you want to think about another example of a concept like that, Suppose that for the sake of discussion, to make a cake, you needed flour, sugar, and water, okay? So those are the three ingredients needed for the cake. Can you make the cake without any of them? No, each one's needed. But suppose that you don't have all three. What if you just had the water, but not the flour or the sugar? You have a necessary ingredient, but is that enough by itself? No. If all you have is water, that's not going to turn into a cake, okay? So it's a necessary component, but it's not enough alone. If you just had the flour, or the flour and the water, do you have enough for the full range of ingredients necessary? No. And so in the same sense, these three things can be thought of as like the ingredients that bake the cake, as it were, of knowledge. One or two of them is not enough. Each one's necessary, but they only amount to knowledge when they're all present uh, at once, okay? So now we're going to quickly try and talk about the Meno, um, which gives us the ancient Greek description and discussion of this topic of knowledge that we just kind of analyzed. Okay, so the Meno. The Meno is a dialogue written by Plato where Socrates, the teacher of Plato, discusses the concept of knowledge with this Greek general, and the guy's name is Meno. And um, this will give you a sort of taste of the way that Socrates discussed topics with people. He would just engage them in lively conversation and uh, develop the understanding of a really important, significant idea or, or topic. In this case, it was knowledge. So Socrates is talking to Mino, right? And I'm just going to read through this with you because it's very short. It's less than a page. So here's the beginning of the dialogue. Socrates says this to Mino. He says, 
Nino, a man who knew the way to Larissa or anywhere else you like and went there and guided others would surely lead them well and correctly? In reply, Mino says, certainly, Socrates. So let me break down, you know, I'm going to break down each little passage of the writing line by line. What Socrates is asking here to Mino is this. Suppose someone knows how to get to Larissa. Now, what is Larissa? Larissa is a city in Athens that's about, sorry, in Greece, that's about 100 miles north of Athens. So it's, it's a long journey for people back in that time period without modern transportation to get to Larissa. But it's another part of Greece, another city in Greece. Um, 100 miles north of Athens where they're talking. And all that Socrates has asked Tamino is this. Suppose that someone knows how to get to Larissa from Athens, meaning that they've gone there many times, they've completed this journey successfully on a number of previous occasions. If you know how to get to a place based on your experience going there, couldn't you lead someone that has not been there to the same destination? And the answer Mino gives back is yes. Okay, so making that a little more relatable to you, um, right now I'm thinking you're probably at home or whatever or someplace in a nice, cozy, secure location. Um, do you know how to get to, let's say, Chapman from where you're at right now? Probably because you've been to Chapman and I know that we've all been there together in the not too distant past. So since you know how to get to Chapman from wherever you're at right now, do you think that you could lead a total stranger to Chapman based on your guidance and your knowledge formed from your previous ventures, trips over to Chapman? Right? Simple question. Could you lead a person to Chapman that's never been there based on your own knowledge of how to get there? And the clear answer is yes. Hopefully we can all follow that, right? So to start the dialogue, that's Socrates' question. If someone knows how to get to a place, in his case, Larissa, but whatever, in any example, if you know how to get to a place, can you lead someone else that's not been there to the place? And Mino says yes. Okay? So now, the dialogue continues. Socrates asks a new question after that. He says this, so what if someone had had a correct opinion as to which was the way, but had not gone there, nor indeed had knowledge of it? Wouldn't he also lead correctly? And Mino again says, certainly, Socrates. So now the second question is a little different. He's asking Mino, well, suppose that someone does not really know how to get to Larissa, but they have a correct opinion as to how to get there, not knowledge. Okay, now this term correct opinion that Socrates is referring to here. <clears throat> that is um, just his phrasing of two out of the three conditions of knowledge without the third. So what do you think a correct opinion is? It's two parts of the knowledge definition without the other one. So just based on the synonyms here, correct opinion, what two parts of JTB do you think that stands for? Correct opinion is blank and blank without what? Let's see if you can follow my question and give me a basic answer to that. What do you think is the term correct opinion in reference to? Say someone has a correct opinion but not knowledge. They have two parts of the knowledge equation, but not three. So what two does correct opinion stand for? A true belief, correct, TB but not J. Okay, a true belief without justification. So Socrates' second question to Mino is this question. He's saying, so what if a person does not actually know how to get there because they've never gone on their own? But nonetheless, they have a correct opinion as to how to get there, meaning that they have like true instructions, but they never use these instructions. It's kind of like the idea of a person having a map that is accurate in its directions as to the destination and how to get there, but they never had to use this map before on their own. So they don't have the knowledge that the map works, but it does actually work. You understand? So it's like, could a person use in the modern terminology a GPS navigation device to reach a destination when they don't actually know how to get there from their own previous experience. And what Mino says is yes, and I think you can relate to that. So you know how to get to Chapman, but suppose you had never gone to Chapman before and you're just relying on Google Maps. Couldn't you use this accurate set of instructions to get you there just as easily or just as well as the knowledge that another person is using without any map at all? Okay, and Mino says yes to that. So Socrates continues, and he says, so as long as he has the right opinion about that of which the other has knowledge, he will not be a worse guide than the one who knows, since he has a true opinion, even if it's not knowledge. And Mino says, in no way worse. So now Socrates wants to probe him with a new question. 
If a correct opinion will get you to Larissa, just as easily as the knowledge would, then why is it better to know as opposed to just having a correct opinion? Why do people value knowledge more than just correct opinions if they both get you to the same results, the correct outcome? Now, why do you think? Do you have a view about that? Like in the modern situation, is there any advantage in terms of knowing how to get somewhere versus having to rely on a navigator to get there? What would be the benefit of the knowledge, if any? Is there a benefit? Is there something that is, is better to your advantage to actually know, let's say, how to reach a place because you've gone there many times instead of just having to rely on instructions that happen to be correct? But what, would there be any benefit to having the real knowledge? What do you think? And what would it be? What could be the extra advantage um, of really knowing your way there instead of merely having to use correct maps? What would be that benefit? Could there be one? What would it be? Let's see you say. You understand the question, right? Like case one, you know how to get there. You don't need a map. Case two, you don't know. You've never gone, but you got a map and it works. So is there? what's better about having the knowledge? Okay, so Matthew, you say you may know the optimal route as opposed to the designated route. Now that's true. So you're going to be skilled in how to get there based on your previous journeys. And that might give you the knowledge about how to sort of make more efficiency in getting there. That's one aspect of it. Here's another, though, that I was thinking maybe some of you would pick up on, or maybe it's in your mind, um, that if you really know how to get there, you can trust the knowledge that you have as the secure route to arrival. But if you've never done it before, then you don't really know whether to trust these directions, even though they are correct. Suppose you reach a fork in the road where the instructions on the map are hard to correlate with what you're seeing in reality. Because you've never done it before, you might distrust the map, or you might get lost along your way. Or if there is a random road closure, you don't know alternate routes because you've never gone on your own. So you would think, right, that knowing means you'll always get there. And having a correct map because of your, let's say, lack of confidence in it, you might sometimes get lost along the way. And so that's what Socrates says next. He says, so, Mino, correct opinion is not less useful than knowledge. And Mino gives him this response. He says, well, to that extent, Socrates, but... The man who has knowledge will always succeed, whereas the man who has true opinion will only succeed at times. Now, Socrates plays with him a little, and he's trying to make it seem like, is that really obvious? I mean, what's, what's the difference? If the map works, isn't that good enough? He says, but how do you mean? Won't he who has the right opinion not always succeed as long as his opinion is right? And Mino says, that appears to be so of necessity. And you're making me wonder, Socrates, if this is true, why is knowledge prized far more highly than the right opinion? And why are they different? And now Socrates says, well, do you know why you're wondering, or should I tell you? Mino says, by all means, tell me. And Socrates goes into now a little bit of a description of a cultural myth that existed in Athens, Greece, to make a point. He says this, um, it is because you have paid no attention to the statues of Daedalus, but perhaps there are none in Thessaly. So right now, Socrates is mentioning the sculptor in Greece at the ancient time of Athens, whose name was Daedalus. That's his name, Daedalus. Um, <clears throat> Marissa, your question was, is it the difference between relying upon yourself versus relying upon something else? Well, yeah, if you have knowledge, that's something that you possess internally. When you have to rely on an external aid, it's directing you to the correct course, but it's not based on something that you know of your own um, information and expertise previously assembled. So it's better, one would think, to have the knowledge. But let's go over this Daedalus point really quick. So Socrates asks Mino, have you ever heard of these statues of Daedalus? Maybe they don't exist in Thessaly, where Mino is from. But anyway, Daedalus was a well-known sculptor in ancient Greece. He made these beautiful, realistic-looking sculptures of human figures that were so realistic-like and so realistic and lifelike that there was this myth that developed, that if you acquired one of these priceless Daedalus sculpture statues, that you should tie them to the ground literally with ropes, because if you didn't do that, then when you go to sleep at night or when you're not looking, these super realistic statues, when they're not tied down by ropes, they might just what, according to the myth? What do you think they believe? Why should they tie them down with ropes? Because they're so darn realistic that if you don't do that, they're bound to what when you turn your back? They thought this. The reason why the ropes would be advised, according to the myth, is that if you didn't have them, what do you think they believed would happen? to our statues, that they would walk away. Yeah, they're so lifelike, they just turn to life and go away. Now, of course, in reality, these are probably just being stolen or something in the night, but the ropes were given 
as a method to secure them and prevent them from leaving. Now, this is used as a metaphor for Socrates, okay? He says, take the two cases. Suppose you could have these statues with the ropes, tying them to the ground, or the same statue but with no ropes at all. He's saying that that's kind of parallel to having knowledge, which is grounded by evidence, and now the evidence is like an analog to the ropes, versus having a correct opinion, which is not tied down by any reasons or evidence. So in the same way, a correct opinion that's not based on anything, that's not based on any grounds or evidence, is likely to leave your mind just as much as these statues are likely to leave one's property if they're not tethered to the ground by ropes. So true opinions without justification are compared to the statues without ropes. And correct beliefs that do have justification, therefore which are knowledge, those are compared to the statues with ropes. So why is it better to have knowledge? Because it adds that extra additional element of justification, which prevents the true beliefs from leaving your mind, and then you get to keep them forever. So, for example, going back to our student that was confused on the multiple choice test, but they happened to guess the correct answer. If they really didn't know the answer, and then they just guessed and got lucky, would they have given the correct answer 100 times if they took this test 100 different times? No because since they didn't know it in the first place, they would forget the correct answer, or maybe they would distrust what response they were bubbling in. But if you know the answer based on evidence and reasons, and you fill it out confidently because you're fully aware of all the justification behind the answer, then you don't just fill it out correctly today or for now, but you would fill it out correctly in a year, in 10 years, over and over again reliably. So having a true belief with justification is better than having a true belief with no justification, for the same reason that having these ropes with the statues is superior to having them without, because the addition of the ropes or justification keeps the thing from leaving either in the one case your property or in the case of the true belief, your mind. You don't retain information that you don't have beliefs based on evidence for. So you can change your mind on a question like, do aliens exist 100 times in a year based on whether you feel like it or not. But if evidence came forward and you knew it after that, then you would no longer flip flop on the question. So I'm going to just, I know we're reaching the end and we're at 9.50, but I'm going to read the last paragraph here and then we'll close and summarize Gettier next time. So we have a little catching up still to do, but for Friday, do read Gettier and uh, Descartes and we'll go over those on Friday. So last piece, it says this. What do you have in mind when you say this, Socrates? Mino asks about the statue. Socrates says, they run away and escape too if one does not tie them down, but they remain in place if they are tied down. Mino says, so what? Socrates says, to acquire an untied work of Daedalus is not worth much like acquiring a runaway slave because it does not remain. But it is worth much if it is tied down because his works are very beautiful. What am I thinking of when I say this? True opinions. Because true opinions, as long as they remain, are a fine thing and all they do is good. But they are not willing to remain long. And they escape from a man's mind so that they are not worth much until one ties them down by giving an account of the reason why. After that, they are tied down and they become knowledge and they remain in place. That is why knowledge is prized higher than correct opinion, and knowledge differs from correct opinion in that it is tied down. Okay, and I'm just going to close with that. Think about how when we talk about justified beliefs, we even use uh, terms that speak to the metaphor of grounding. We say that a well-justified belief is grounded on something, that it's based on something. And these ropes literally base or ground the statues, so there's that kind of at least uh, terminological overlap between the metaphor and the real topic of knowledge here. Okay, so we've gone over Plato's Mino today, and we completed our initial opening discussion of epistemology. So continue reading through the notes, try to read Gettier and Descartes' Meditations for Friday, and um, I'll be back with you guys then. I'll have your papers midterms graded uh, no later than Friday, uh, so we'll be talking about that too over the next few days. But thanks everybody, have a great day, and I will definitely see you guys soon. Um, until next time, take care. <clears throat>